So this is going to serve as part two of the et of the lecture that I was giving on Merleau-Ponty's primacy of perception article. Um, and when last we talked, uh, that ever so long ago for me, which is quite literally 15 minutes to let the video load and then uh, make some coffee, break for coffee. Um, when last we, we chatted, uh, I was talking about how on page 16, Merleau-Ponty's big contribution comes to light. Now, when I say his big contribution, I mean the importance and centrality of the body for knowing and being in the world. Not just talking about the human as the human subject or as Dasein or as some ego in the world, but as a body subject. Embodiment is central to understanding Merleau-Ponty's thought. Okay? So, the body subject is that being which is capable of observing from different perspectives the infinity of presences available in the perception of any given object. What's important to note here is that when Merleau-Ponty says body subject, he does not mean that as synonymous with a human being, because there are plenty of embodied subjects that can perceive the infinity of presences available to them from any given object. But they do so to varying degrees, right? So certain kinds of primates, bonobos, gorillas, chimpanzees, etc., are going to have really keen perception that allows them to understand perspective to an extent that other types of animals are not going to have. There are also other types of mammals that have that sort of thing. I, I could be completely off base, but I have, I think that dolphins also are able to see perspectively, but I'm not exactly sure. Don't quote me on that. I'm not a zoologist, but I'm making this point as erroneous as my uh, zoological understanding might be uh, to to make to emphasize to underline that for Merleau-Ponty, perceiving subject is quite literally that is not just a human being as we understand it with all the presuppositions that go into being a human being. This is that social scientific side of his influence and training coming coming out in his thought. Okay, so with that brief uh, reminder of where we left off taken care of, where are we going next? Well, because only a being with a body is capable of observing from any number of perspectives perspectives, perception is claimed by Merleau-Ponty to be paradoxical. The paradox of perception is this, that on the one hand, the object of perception exists because it can be perceived. One cannot imagine an object in itself. Right? I can't come up with an object in and of itself I am perceiving it even in my imagining. All right. This is a reversal or an inversion or a remix of sorts of Descartes, right? For Descartes, when I am doubting, when I am imagining, when I am uh, questioning, doing all sorts of things, I'm thinking. All of those are thinking operations of the ego cogito. For Merleau-Ponty, it is even when I am doing those seemingly internal to the mind activities, I am perceiving. I am perceiving myself. So the object of perception exists only because it can be perceived. But that object is both imminent and transcendent. 
it is imminent in the sense that the object is always perceivable. It is always present to us. But it is transcendent because the object is always more than is immediately given. So let me, let me break that down a little bit. Remember back, we we're talking about the book. The cover of the book is visible to you. The cover of the book is present to you. The back of the book is not present to you. The back of the book is present as absent. The object is always more than what is immediately given. What is immediately given to you is the absence of the back of the book, is the contents of the interior of the book, is what the book looks like. My particular one still has all of these little, uh, here's your ASMR, um, all of these uh, markers here from when I did my dissertation. Um, because I read this book a lot. Um, but the point being that perception of objects is paradoxical because they are both perceivable to us, present to us, and transcendent beyond us because they are more than what is immediately given. So Merleau-Ponty then moves on from this point saying that it is through this experience that the words rational and real receive meaning simultaneously through our experience we are given the world yet the world reveals itself as that which is always already there so i want to pause and think about this because it's a major major point he's trying to make here we know the world by experiencing the world even as the world has always already been there for us. In other words, we discover that which has always been present. It's always been there, but we are discovering it as though it is new to us. And because perception is perspectival, that means that we are discovering it anew, even as we might believe ourselves to have known it in its completion. Think about the new shades of behavior, the new ways that you come to understand the people that you might know the most, family members, friends, a partner, etc., right? Your dog. You might know them extremely well, and yet the more time you spend with them, the different perspectives you get to take on what they're doing reveals to you that they are far more complex than you might have initially believed. The same is true of the world for Merleau-Ponty. The world reveals itself as not having its origin in us, but rather that we are thrown into a situation. Remember from Heidegger, thrownness. We are thrown into a situation, transcended on all sides by the world, and yet able to interact with that world. Merleau-Ponty then moves on to contemplating the following question. How are my experiences related to the experience which others have of the same objects. This is, again, very Cartesian, but Merleau-Ponty is doing this because he is giving this talk, which became the article, Primacy of Perception, to an academic audience in France. And their chief person, uh, their chief point of reference is going to be Descartes. That is the level of influence and esteem given to Descartes in French philosophical culture, French intellectual culture in general. So Merleau-Ponty is asking a very kind of, is a very Cartesian question. How are my experiences related to the experience which others have of the same objects? Well, 
he breaks it down into a number of parts. First, perception is simple perception. It's simple sensations, right? It could be private or mine alone. Perception could also be seen as acts of the intellect, right? Where we're talking about the same world, but that world is an ideal existence, right? So in the first sense of talking about perception, we could be talking about just my own observations, right? In the second one, we could be talking about the world as this kind of general thing that we all share, but we never experience it the same. And then he says both are insufficient to account for our experience because our experience of one another and of this shared world is something altogether different. The separation in consciousness between you and I is recognized only after a failure of communication, which is to say that we are originarily in an undivided sense of being between us. There is a form of primordial communication between us, but because it is so primordial, it is unintelligible. This is another way that Merleau-Ponty is talking about human beings connecting to one another without needing a language to do so. But because it's at such a fundamental primordial level, it, it doesn't really make sense, right? We can talk about it in terms of affinity for one another or familiarity without having to really communicate using recognizable gestures or vocalizations. But if perception is not the sum of simple sensations, and if it is not a relation to an idea of the world, then we need another account of perception that makes sense of our relation to one another. And so to do this, Merleau-Ponty begins with what we see. We see another who acts like me, right? I see someone who acts like me as a human within my perceptual field. But this field is an interconnection of actual and possible meanings. That means that the other's behavior is understood by me because the other appropriates the world like I do. As Merleau-Ponty says on page 18, I understand the behavior, the words of another. I espouse his thought because this other, born in the midst of my phenomena, appropriates them and treats them in accord with typical behaviors which I myself have experienced. Just as my body, as the system of all my holds on the world, founds the unity of the objects which I perceive in the same way the body of the other, as the bearer of symbolic behaviors and of the behavior of true reality, tears itself away from being one of my phenomena, offers me the task of a true communication, and confers on my object the new dimension of intersubjective being or, in other words, of objectivity. Such are, in a quick resume, the elements of a description of the perceived world. Merleau-Ponty then, from there, moves on to a common question. What is the relation of my perception to my intellection? Do I not know that there is a life of ideas, that there is a meaning of everything I experience, and that every one of my most convincing thoughts will need additions and then will be not destroyed, but at least integrated into a new unity? This is the only conception of knowledge that is scientific and not mythological. So he says on page 20, Knowledge then, according to Merleau-Ponty, operates in the following way. Both intellect and perception do not get the essence of things immediate, immediately. Rather, they are routes by which experience clarifies itself. What saves us, Merleau-Ponty says, is the possibility of development. New ideas and information are incorporated into the whole of our experience. Body schema requires a total reorganization around the particular experiences that develop our understanding of the world.
And in the end, Merleau-Ponty isn't trying to destroy the absolute or rationality in general. What he is trying to do is show how we get to rationality through perception.